It's finally here. Second Timothy 2.15 reminds us to study or be diligent to present ourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of truth is obviously reference to God's holy word, rightly dividing God's word. Let's uh, ask God's blessing on our service. Uh, Brother David, you want to lead us in prayer, please? Amen. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 212. Stand and sing with me, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. 212. <laughs> song for 45 years and it doesn't get old it's just as true as it can be what washes away our sin blood of Jesus Christ what cleanses us the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin doesn't it what can atone for sin nothing but the blood of Jesus that third verse says nothing can for sin atone nothing but the blood not of good that I have done it's not a, not of good works that we do it's solely uh, through the death of our Lord Jesus Christ and, and in scripture when it talks about the blood of Christ the death of Christ the cross of Christ those are all referring to the exact same event where Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary bearing our sin in his own body died in our place paid the debt and, uh, and now is able to forgive pardon cleanse wash uh, away our sin don't ever forget that blessed truth. Well, just some upcoming events. First of all, let me explain the bow tie. In case you didn't know, this is a bow tie. Got a lot of remarks on it. My dog, granddaughter Penelope bought this for me for Christmas. And uh, I just keep waiting for a good time to wear it. And I said, today's a good day. I'm going to wear my bow tie. Thank you, Penelope. And I got a lot of good comments on it. 
Uh, the Lindsay family yesterday afternoon was a great, great blessing. We had a great turnout with a lot of unsaved community people, and that's who we're targeting, and so we just praise the Lord for that. Uh, Wednesday evening is our midweek prayer and praise service. Uh, come expecting a blessing, bring your Bible, and be ready to pray. Our church cleaning this week is you, all of you, be a blessing. Uh, if you aren't on our regular schedule, then this is your week to come and dust a little, vacuum a little, clean a window, do whatever you want, but uh, take part in cleaning the church this week. Uh, Bill's on uh, lawn mowing this week. Well, that's Crystal out there. Maybe he'll put her on the mower. I don't know. Uh, fellowship lunch and Bible study. We, we're going to implement this. We've kind of gotten out of the habit or whatever, but every first and third Sunday of the month now, okay, we're just going to go with that. Every first and third Sunday of the month, we're going to have a fellowship lunch, a bag lunch, just to share something. Um, and, and following that, we're going to have a, a brief time of Bible study or devotional time, okay? So that's just going to be the first and third Sunday of every month, except this month. We're not going to have it next Sunday, which is the third Sunday of the month, uh, because Peter Nilsson will be with us on the fourth Sunday of the month, and we want to have a fellowship lunch with him. So once in a while when we have guest speakers and we want to have a lunch and stuff with them, uh, so, so he, Peter Nilsson is going to be with us for Sunday school, the morning service, fellowship lunch, and a question and answer time after the service. That's two weeks from today, okay? Uh, the Thursday before that, okay, not this Wednesday, the following week prayer meeting, we're moving to Thursday instead of Wednesday uh, because H.C. Stephen had so many churches he wanted to be with and wasn't able to get us in. Uh, but we were flexible so we could move our prayer meeting to Thursday night. And maybe that'll fit some of your schedules better so you can be with us. But uh, Brother Stephen, uh, I'm not sure if Ching Boy will be with him or not, but we look forward to them. Uh, then Brother Noah over in Ghana, I mentioned this last week, uh, has a catfish farm that they're getting underway. Uh, this is to help provide food for his family, for the church family, and then for the ministry in general. Uh, what excess fish they have, they'll be selling at the market, to the, and the proceeds will go back into the ministry. So if you'd like to help out in that, we have a special box uh, out just outside the foyer door there on the left-hand side. You'll see it, a uh, special offering, and just put that your money in there for that catfish project. All right? Any other announcements? Okay. Just also thank you for all who came and helped yesterday, uh, greeting people, setting up, taking down, bringing food in. Uh, appreciated all your work there. Hymn number 321, Nothing Between.
added this hymn to sing is because after the first one, nothing but the blood, that saves us. But even though we've been saved, we need to be walking daily with the Lord Jesus. We need to maintain a close fellowship with the Lord. And sometimes we get distracted by this world, by trials, by problems, and, and we get our eyes off the Savior. And now this song is talking about, I don't want anything to be coming between me and the Savior. We want to have close fellowship as we walk in this life. On the fourth verse. come to our church as an ordained minister. Means he has the title reverend before his name. He's been officially recognized uh, by a church and ordained, designated as a minister of the gospel. Um, maybe he'll come to our church and not be ordained. And it will become us as a church then to officially examine, analyze his life, uh, his testimony, and his doctrine, uh, and to officially recognize him as a man called of God for the pastoral ministry. Uh, ordination is necessary, um, really just to main church, maintain church order and to maintain a high, godly, biblical standard for ministry. Not just anybody can... We don't want just anybody coming in and pastoring churches. Uh, we want to make sure that he is a man of God, that he is competent and articulate in handling the word of God, um, and, and that he is in, indeed called by God. You see, it's God who outfits and calls a man to the ministry. Uh, just like in Jeremiah chapter 1, where God says to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Uh, God had, from the get-go, way back before a man was formed or fashioned in the womb, God had already sets them apart and designates them and outfits and prepares them for special ministry. He did that in the Old Testament with prophets, priests, kings. Um, and oftentimes they were officially recognized as called of God then, uh, by other prophets, by the laying on of hands, by the anointing of oil, they were known as God's anointed. Well, pastors today are not technically God's anointed, but they are called of God. And they are set apart, ordained, recognized by the church as being called of God. But it's God who does the calling, the outfitting. It's the church then who recognizes and sees in that man God's hand of blessing and direction and appoints him, designates him, separates him, tasks him with the, with the responsibility of pastoral ministry. Um, in the first century, it was the apostles that did that. Acts chapter 14, Titus chapter 1, Paul gives uh, authority to Timothy or to Titus himself, Barnabas. Uh, they were to go and they were to ordain elders, ordain, that is to uh, set them apart, to designate them as pastors, teachers, bishops, overseers in the churches. And so as Paul, Timothy, Titus, Barnabas, as these men went out and started churches or visited churches, Thessalonica, Philippi, uh, whatever, Laodicea, uh, from among the elders in the church, the spiritual men, spiritually wise, mature men in the church, there would be some that they would identify and set apart as being called of God 
to pastor, to shepherd that flock. And so they were ordained, they were appointed to that ministry. The procedure today is usually that a church recognizes the call of God in a man. We believe that he is called of God, uh, but, but we need help as a church. Uh, not all of us uh, can, can actually analyze and critically uh, see if a man is fit for the ministry. And so we call in, a church will call in other pastors, ordained ministers um, of like precious faith, and they will come and on a day... Uh, Thursday afternoon, whatever, they will convene a council that only exists for that short period of time, and these pastors together uh, with the church then will sit and critique this man. Um, usually uh, he presents a paper, his doctrinal position, and they're trying to analyze that man's uh, doctrinal position, whether it's accurate, articulate, and whether he can defend his biblical position uh, from the scriptures and then they also uh, examine his testimony and his Christian character um, to see if he's been called and fitted by God for the ministry and then the church if the council says yes we believe he is uh, that doesn't mean he's perfect <laughs> uh, doesn't mean that uh, he fully understands everything but his doctrine is is sound maybe he's a little weak in this area they recommend to him doing a little more study or reading but but they say yes we believe he's called of God and fit for the public ministry of the gospel uh, then the church then uh, will proceed with the official ordination the laying on of hands, which doesn't confer any powers or abilities, the laying on of hands by the other clergymen uh, and the church, the representatives of the church is kind of a, a, a form of symbolically recognizing that we as a church recognize this man as called of God. It doesn't confer him with any special powers, abilities, gifts, or authorities. Uh, it's just a representation or symbolic recognition that God has called that man to be the pastor. Uh, ordination is uh, less about a man's uh, formal education and more about his character. Uh, in fact, in Scripture, you will find zero qualifications concerning a man's education for the ministry. Like the, uh, uh, the apostles, they were all fishermen. They were rednecks from Galilee that Jesus appointed to the ministry. It's not about education. It's about his competency to know the word of God and to handle it accurately. Uh, to be able to teach the holy scriptures, make sense of them. Um, and so it's not about education. There's a lot of men who graduate from Bible colleges and seminaries. They may have a master of divinity. They may have a doctor of divinity. They may have all sorts of degrees, bachelor's degrees and master's degrees uh, in theology, but who are not qualified to pastor the church. Their character, as a matter of fact, when you read in Titus chapter 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 3, the qualifications given for a, a bishop, pastor, overseer, uh, they have to do with character. They're, in fact, there's only one ability ever even mentioned uh, for a qualification for a pastor, and that is ability to teach. Um, but So it's not about his education, it's not about degrees earned, it's about his knowledge of, his, of the word, spiritual maturity, uh, and is able to handle the word of God competently and teach it. My personal ordination was in 1980. Yep, I was a little younger then. Um, and uh, it was a blessing because my dad was elected from the council as the moderator of the, of the council. He didn't have any mercy on me. Uh, there were 27 other men representing churches um, who I had a paper that I presented, a, I think it was 20 some pages, 20, 30 pages, uh, which was my doctrinal statement. It was my personal confession of faith. And I presented that, and then over the course of three hours, before the intimidating ministers gruelingly questioned me, I had to defend everything I said in that doctrinal statement. And uh, after that then, um, the, the council met and voted to proceed, or to proceed to, with the church to proceed with ordaining me as a pastor, and conferred on me the title of reverend. That title reverend doesn't make any person any more reverend than any other good Christian. 
Uh, it is an official ecclesiastical title. I never use the term uh, reverend uh, when I'm in a church setting or talking to Christians. I use it though, however, uh, on legal papers, weddings, baptisms, certificates, uh, funerals, those kind of things that I sign, uh, it's, it's reverend. Um, I also use it, I have to confess, I use it to pull rank occasionally. <laughs> when I call the hospital to ask how Harold's doing or one of you, and they give me to run around, oh, and, you know, the hippo thing, and blah, blah, and I go, this is Reverend Bantle. <clears throat> And he's one of my parishioners. Of course, you have to use parishioner. We never use that word either, but that's what they understand. Oh, I'll, I'll get you the nurse right away. They'll get you the information. So uh, that was uh, my ordination, and that was my beautiful, beautiful bride on that happy occasion. So, uh, but that's what an ordination is, what an ordination council is. Uh, the fact that the church called me to be the pastor close to, I don't know, almost a year prior to the council meeting, uh, suggested that the church had already believed that I was called of, the, of God to be a minister, and then the council kind of officially recognized and, and encouraged the church to proceed officially with that. So that's what an ordination is, and we don't know if the pastor we're looking for will be ordained, or if we as a church will have to ordain him, uh, but keep that in mind. All right, ushers, come and receive our Lord's tithes and offerings, please. As you realize, some of our things I'm going over on Sunday mornings now are an overflow of what we're studying on Wednesday nights in our preparation for calling of a pastor. Zeke, would you ask God's blessing on our offerings, please? Dear Holy Father, we thank you for this wonderful day today. Um, we thank you for the opportunity for um, church today, Lord. And um, thank you for another day of life, Lord, and um, that we can spend it and some of it to honor and glorify you, Lord. And um, we thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins, Lord, and give us another chance um, that we can have eternal life with you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Let's back up here. Let's have Brother Dan come and, and uh, pray for our next pastor and uh, then lead us in uh, hymn number 500. All right, if you will bow with me in prayer as we pray for our next shepherd. Heavenly Father, we just humbly come before you as a congregation, just seeking your, your grace and your wisdom in uh, us finding a next shepherd, Lord. We pray that we always trust in you to guide our our actions and our steps, Lord, and, and diligently seeking a new shepherd, Lord. We praise, or we pray, Lord, that you will um, just uh, raise up a man of God who will lead this church, that will continue the gospel ministry that you have graciously established here in Marion and around the world, Lord. And we pray that as a congregation, we will remain 
um, just prayerful, steadfast, united, Lord, in in this transition period. And in the meantime, Lord, we just continue to pray for Pastor Bannel that you will continue to use him to encourage him, to strengthen him as he preaches your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, now at this time, if you will stand and sing uh, one of the favorite hymns of mine, hymn 500, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. of Christ. I do have one more announcement. Um, this morning our pulpit committee is going to meet, just a reminder for all the pulpit committee folks, but also this morning our pulpit committee is going to introduce a special guest. Um, this is going to be Mr. Ezekiel Melchizedek McCoy. Um, he has come to Grace Baptist Church uh, to see if he can be ordained this morning. So. It'll be a good time. <laughs> I heard you was all looking for a preacher. <laughs> yes, hi, Uncle Zeke. Yes, I wants to be a preacher. Yes, I was a Christian, blood bought, spirit and dwelt, sin bashing, Satan trashing, Bible toting Christian. Does I know the Bible? I know the Bible from kibber to kibber. I know the cover too, because it say the Holy Bible right on it. Well, I guess I like the Book of Luke the best. Come to think of it, it contained the parable of the Good Samaritan, which goes like this. There was a man going down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And as he went down that road, thorns rose up and choked him a hundredfold. But the angel of the Lord done strove with him and set him free. Now about that time, the queen of Sheba, she come by, gave that man 30 pieces of silver. With that 30 pieces of silver, he went out and bought himself a chariot. And he got in that chariot and he drove furiously till he came to that juniper tree 
He catched his hair and the branches thereof. And there he hung. Till Delilah came and cut his hair off. And he fell. And when he fell, he fell on stony ground, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. He looked up. He seen a cloud. It wasn't much bigger than a mustard seed. And it commenced to rain. It, it rained and rained. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> but the Lord had prepared a great fish which swallowed him up for the duration of that tribulation. Now when that great seven years of tribulation was over with, the fish spit him out. Now the Lord had done fed him on man and quail. He come up out of the cave. He looked down. He saw a great big giant. Yeah, it was Goliath. But he passed by on the other side. Well, he proceeds down that road further towards Jericho. And there was a man who told him, come get his supper. He said, man, I can't come get my supper. He said, come get your supper. Man, I can't come get my supper. That man went out into the highways and byways and compelled him to come get his supper. Well, after he'd uh, eaten sumptuously, he said, did not my heart burn within me? Well, finally he makes his way down the road to Jericho and he looks up. He sees up in the window there, Jezebel. He looks around. He says, who's on the Lord's side? And they said, we. He said, fling her down. They fling her down. He says, fling her down again. They fling her down. He says, fling her down again, boys. They take that gal up to the top of the pinnacle of the temple. They cast her down 70 times 7. <laughs> and when they picked up the fragrance that remained, there was 12 baskets. <laughs> Not counting the women's and the kids. Now there's just one question I'd like to ask this year ordination council. Whose wife is she going to be on the day of the resurrection? <laughs> yes. Anyways, we'll dismiss our children for Children's Church. We are looking for a new shepherd. We're not looking for another Tim Bannell. And we're not looking for an Uncle Zeke. We're looking for the man that God has saved and outfitted and called to be our new pastor. And we are praying, as it says in Matthew chapter 9, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth his laborers into the harvest field. And so we're praying that God would send forth his laborer to our church to continue working in this harvest field. What kind of a man are we looking for as the next pastor? Well, this is what our next pastor will be, Lord willing. He's going to be the steward of a household. If you turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and you can put a mark in 1 Timothy because we'll be in 1, 2 Timothy and Titus quite a bit. But the pastor, the man who is an elder, who is appointed as a shepherd, uh, is considered the overseer uh, of a household. It says in chapter 3, verse 5, and this is where the qualifications are. Look at verse 4. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? And so, uh, God says here that one of the qualifications is for a pastor is that he has to rule his own house. He has to be able to stand before rule, not with an iron fist, that's not what the word means. It means to stand before, to preside. That he is the head of a home and that his wife and his household duties and management and finances and children are in order. That's a, that's a requirement. And, and there's a requirement because the church of God is a family. And he's going to be responsible to see that things are done decently in order and that things function properly. And if a man can't administrate or preside in his own family, surely he can't in the family of God. He is a steward. God's steward set over this household. And so he is like a father 
uh, or a, uh, uh, the master of a household. Uh, Titus chapter 1. If you go over to Titus, just three or four more pages to the back of your Bible. Titus chapter 1, again, we have uh, requirements here for the pastor. He says in verse 6, Titus 1, 6, If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. So his children even, not that, not that they have to be believers. Now, when it says faithful children, I know it's the same word as believe, believers. And, and some people take that position that they have to be saved, but, but a pastor doesn't have any control over whether children are genuinely saved. That's God's work. But they do have to be of a trustworthy, confidential matter. They can't, they can't be accused there, as it says, uh, oops, I lost my page, 1-6, uh, uh, of dissipation or insubordinate. They can't be incorrigible. That's the idea. Unruly, incorrigible. Uh, uh, just a tremendous... Poor testimony on on Christ and on the on his on his uh, fatherly household responsibilities, uh, because if that that father is disqualified, he forfeits the, the the privilege of being a pastor. So the the father of a household proves himself that way, and this is one of the reasons that most many people believe that a pastor should be married, so that he can demonstrate uh, this qualification. Uh, I, I personally know many uh, pastors, or I shouldn't say many, I know some who have been um, single all their ministries and have had uh, wonderful productive ministries and in other ways they prove themselves um, able to, to rule and to maintain and preside over things uh, that they had the same qualification. It was just shown in different areas uh, and in different work. So the pastor is important. And when we get a new pastor, we need to encourage him also to take care of his family. Uh, his responsibility, yes, is for the people of God. But, but if his family gets neglected and becomes unruly, and if he's not tending to his own responsibilities, household duties, and finances at home, he's going to end up losing his qualification for the ministry. So we need to make sure that he cares for his household, uh, children, wife, and home so that he can remain as pastor of the church. Second thing is, he's a, a shepherd of a flock. Um, you already have your bookmark in 1 Timothy, but we're going to go back to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And uh, here in Ephesus, uh, we have these elders who are the overseers, the pastors of the churches there. And he says this in verse 28. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. He's telling these elders, he says, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God. Now it's his church, by the way. It's never the pastor's church. It's God's church, which he purchased with his own blood. And that's something God is entrusting the pastor with his sheep that he purchased with his own blood. What a, what a responsibility. These are God's sheep. And yet the Holy Spirit has set them as overseers to shepherd God's flock, the church. They're shepherds and they're to tend the flock. Uh, uh, back in the first century, John Chrysostom, he was known as Golden Throat, he was a great preacher. John Chrysostom uh, was an elder pastor, and uh, there was a young minister came up, and, and they were talking, and he was kind of complaining about how small his flock was. Well, Hebrews chapter 13 reminds the pastor uh, that he has to give account for his sheep. And so John Chrysostom said, uh, they may be small in number, but they'll be more, more than enough when you come to the day of judgment and have to account for them. Uh, so don't complain about how small the flock is. But, but God calls them to shepherd the flock of God. Uh, two things that have part in that idea of shepherding, uh, fruitful pasturage and faithful protection. Pasturage, feeding. Uh, to, to shepherd a flock means to fodder, uh, to tend, to nourish, to make sure that they're, they're growing, they're getting fed. Um, and, and 1 Peter 5, 2 says that very thing. Peter is an elder, and he says to the other elders, he says, feed the flock of God which is among you. Feed it. Uh, it's, it's the word for shepherd. 
uh, poimeno, uh, shepherd the flock, tend to the flock. Uh, and that word really has whatever a shepherd or herdsman would do, that's what you're supposed to do for your flock. Uh, feeding, folding, guarding, guiding, uh, all those things are involved in that word. Um, shepherd the flock, shepherd my sheep. You know, John chapter 20 is that passage where Peter, Peter wrote this book, and I think Peter has in mind his, op, you know, when he met with the Lord Jesus after his resurrection and he was restored to ministry, really. Remember, he denied Christ. And then at the Sea of Galilee there where Jesus kept saying, do you love me, Peter? Do you love me? Do you love me? And, and Peter says, you know I do. You know I do. You know I do. And, and remember what Jesus said to him after every, when Peter said, you know I do? He said, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. And actually, he used two different words, one for sheep and one for lamb that he alternated. He also used two different words for feed. One was the word bosco, uh, to again, to, to feed, to fodder, and the other to shepherd. But they're, they're really synonyms, basically. What a herdsman does to the sheep, guides, guards, feeds, folds, fodders, loves, knows his sheep, calls them by name. That's what you're to do. And God restored Peter to that ministry. And, and that's what a pastor is supposed to do. Know his sheep. Love his sheep. Shepherd the sheep. Feed the sheep. Uh, and then, faithful protection. If you do go over to John chapter 10, uh, you'll note this passage is very familiar. It's one where the Lord Jesus himself is the, the great shepherd. I am the great shepherd. Gives his life for the sheep. But, but in this passage, he's talking about shepherds the difference between a hireling shepherd and a true shepherd and and since the pastor in scripture is supposed to be a shepherd i take this that that this is the qualifications for a pastor uh, john chapter 10 and we'll start in verse 10 the thief does not come except to steal to kill to destroy i have come that they may have life and they may have it up more abundantly i am the good shepherd the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep that's what a good shepherd is supposed to be. Somebody who's willing to lay down his life for the sheep. But a hireling, notice that in, in John chapter 10 verse 12, a hireling, somebody who's just doing it for money, he who is not the shepherd, not the true shepherd, but one who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and does not care about the sheep. It's all about self-pleasing, self-preservation. It's about himself. If, if uh, something else looks better somewhere else, he's going. He leaves the sheep. In my ordination, those three plus hours in front of 27 pastors, they grueled me on this for quite a while. In fact, they actually laughed. Because they said, how long are you going to stay at this church? Well, the church was only a dozen people at the time. And uh, I said, I plan to stay here my whole ministry. And they kind of laughed and said, why would you do that? <laughs> um, you don't think you're going to move on to another church? Because probably of those 27 pastors, 27 of them had been to many, 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 many churches over the years. Um, many of them had stayed at churches three to five years, the average. And uh, I said, no, uh, the analogy in Scripture is the pastor uh, is a shepherd of a flock, and he loves those sheep and will willing to lay down his life for those sheep. He's not a hireling who leaves the sheep. And uh, they said, yeah, well, we'll see, we'll see. And uh, they gave me kind of a hard time about that. And so, well, we'll see. Forty-four years later, you're still stuck with me. But... He stays with the sheep and he lays down his life for the sheep. And he protects the sheep at all costs. Zechariah eleven seventeen. this is in the Old Testament, God's talking about prophets, but he says, woe to those shepherds who leave their flock. I think there's going to be an awful lot of pastors who've up and left their churches for greener pastures and have done a damage to the churches, leaving them pastorless for a year, two, three years. Um, when they should have stayed. Well, pastor is to be a shepherd of a flock. And that's who we're looking for is a new shepherd. Thirdly, he's the uh, shepherd of the sheep. He's shepherd. Uh, uh, I mean, a teacher of students. He's a teacher 
because that's his primary function. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4.12, uh, it's one of the gifts to the church. Uh, he, he's given gifts to the church when he said it on high. Jesus gives gifts. And he says he's given uh, to the church uh, apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers. Those are God's gifts to the church. Pastor, teacher. It's kind of a hyphenated word there, and I think they go together, that the pastor is to be a teacher uh, uh, of the Word of God. That's his primary function. Uh, we're here in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, and uh, you'll notice here that it ends, a bishop then, in verse 2, it must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach. Teaching is the only a, a, a skill ability that we find in God's requirements for a pastor. Everything else has to do with his character. Can he teach? Is he apt to teach? Does he have a, an, a, 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 a tendency to teach? Can he open up the scriptures, make sense of them, and communicate that to the people? This is what God's word says. This is what it means. So that people can grow. So that he's feeding them goes right along with his pastoral duty is to feed. Does he make sense of the Holy Scriptures? That's what a pastor's for. Chapter 4, verse 16, over the page. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. What is the do doctrine? is a word which means teaching. The teachings. This is what you're to teach. And he says, take heed to yourself and to the teachings. Continue in them. For in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Take care of the, the doctrine. 2 Timothy chapter 2, just over a few pages, in verse 15. He says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You're to be diligent. Give yourself to the study and teaching of the word of God. It needs to be accurate, articulate. And you need to study. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.13, just back up a little bit. He says, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> that pattern of sound words is the, the uh, New Testament teaching that, that, that Paul was getting. Remember, not everything was written down yet, okay? But, but th those teachings from the Apostle Paul, New Testament truth, uh, Timothy, you have to hold that fast and teach that. Continue in it. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24 and 25. This is a great picture of the pastor here. Uh, verse, let's start in verse, well, actually verse 22. He says, flee youthful lusts, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the name of our Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And the servant of the Lord, Timothy, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to pastors. Servant of the Lord must not quarrel. He's not to be argumentative and bickering and fighting. Don't get into arguments and strife. That's not, that's, that's not productive. Don't be argumentative and quarrelsome, but be gentle to all. Able to teach. There it is again. It's mentioned in 1 Timothy 3, 2, and here apt to teach. Be a teacher. Just teach the Word of God. Don't argue. Don't bicker. Don't fight with people. Just, just teach the Word of God. And he says this what? Patient. Be patient in it. In other words, you need to endure ill. People are insulting you. They disagree with you. Uh, they don't like you. It doesn't matter. Just keep teaching the Word of God. Just keep teaching it. Persevere in it. Continue in it. Teach teach, teach, day after day, week after week, teach the Word of God. Verse 25, in humility. It's not me. It's not the pastor. It's the Word of God. It's truth. It's God's truth. I'm just His vessel, and I just teach God's Word, correcting those who are in opposition. If God, perhaps, will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Whether these are unbelievers that come to faith, or whether they're Christians who are holding false doctrine, or ignorant doctrines, whatever. Timothy, your job isn't to fight and argue about these things. Just teach the Word of God. Keep on teaching the Word of God week after week, and God in His time 
will change people's hearts. And that's the important thing that the pastor, he's not God. He can't regenerate people. He can't sanctify people. He can't illuminate their minds. He can't strengthen them in the inner man. That's the work of God. The pastor has to realize that he can only do what he's called to do. Teach the word of God. Teach the word of God. And God's promise is that his word will not return unto him void. God will take care of all the rest. Faithfully teach the word of God. Patiently. Enduring ill. Forbear whatever people think or say about you. Don't argue. Just keep teaching the word of God. That they, verse 26, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. But only God can do that work. You just teach the word of God. So the pastor is the teacher of students. And then he's also the preacher, just across the page to chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. Uh, Paul says this in the first verse, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Preach the word. The word preach here has the idea of herald. <laughs> Like a, a town crier. Get out on the street and yell. Let it be known. Preach the word of God. And it has actually a, a, the connotation that's used oftentimes with the preaching of the good news. The gospel. Tell people the good news. Yesterday, uh, even though it was just a brief opportunity at the concert, we had a lot of unsaved community people here. And had an opportunity to declare Jesus Christ as the Lord God and the only Savior. Um, and, but as a herald who proclaims the good news, preaching the word, uh, take heed to thyself and, and, and again to, your, to, your, to the teachings, to the doctrine. Preach it. Preach the word. Uh, a lot of people get up and they preach a lot of other things. But, but the word of God has to be the foundation, the basis of our teaching and preaching always. Preacher of the Holy Scriptures. And then he, this pastor is going to be just an instrument. Even though he is a uh, called of God as a special person maybe uh, outfitted and set apart by God, designated by the church and given this title of reverend, uh, he, he's only a vessel. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says what? We, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Paul considered... The Apostle Paul even considered himself nothing but a clay pot. I'm just a pot that God uses. A, a clay pot. Why? So that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. God has chosen not to use angels, some other divine creature. He's chosen to use you and I as the vehicles of teaching and preaching the word of God. And even the apostles themselves, Timothy, Barnabas, Titus, these men were, were nothing but clay pots that God uses. And so in 1 Corinthians there he says, uh, we, we water, we sow, we fertilize, we trim, we prune. We, we do these things because that's what God calls us to do. But we're nothing. It's God who gives the increase. God calls us to be just a vessel that he can use. And we filled with the Spirit of God, filled with studying in the Word of God. We teach and preach the Word of God week after week, and we leave it up to God because He's the one that gives the increase. He's the one that saves people, regenerates them by the preaching of the Word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. And so as the Word is taught, people do get saved, and people are sanctified by the Word of truth. Not in the pastor's time. Pastors like to see things happen instantly. They don't. It, it's in God's timing. That's why I think that's one reason I enjoy mowing my lawn so much. Because I mow it, I turn around and look. Wow, it's great, you know. Because on Sunday, week after week, you go home and you don't see results. You don't see necessarily immediate results in the hearts of people. Um, but you do over years, and that's one of the blessings of being in the ministry a long time, I can look back and I can see the fruit of people's lives and the changes and the growth and the maturity, and, I, and then their children, and I see their children growing up to love the Lord, and, and, and what a blessing that is. But 
we are but instruments, uh, the tool of God. Well, we're also the superintendent of a workforce. Uh, even though we are the servant, he would be uh, greatest among you, let him be servant of all, right? Well, the pastor should be the greatest servant in the church. Uh, the word deacon means servant. The deacons are servants. They serve the Lord, serve our church, but the pastor leads in that serving. Nonetheless, even though he's a servant in the body of Christ, he also is appointed a position of overseer. It's the Greek word uh, for what we use the word bishop for, uh, episkopos, and it means to oversee, superintend. And so God has set the pastor uh, in the church as the overseer. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, if a man desires the position of a bishop, that word bishop, is, it's that word overseer. He desires a good work. A bishop then must be, and we have those qualifications given the husband of one wife, etc., etc. Um, but he's the superintendent of a workforce. Uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, we looked at this verse earlier. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers. And then he uses the word to shepherd, poimene. You're, so so the, the pastor is not only the shepherd, but he's the overseer. And uh, that's, that's one of his functions, to oversee the, the work of the, uh, of the church. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, feed the flock of God. Peter's talking to the elders, as he was, and uh, he says, okay, you're to feed the flock of God. So the term elder, pastor, or feed there, that's the word poimene, to pastor, um, and then taking the oversight of it, bishop, overseer, all three of those are used of the same office in the church. Elder, bishop, and pastor uh, are all the same uh, person. Feed the flock, shepherd them, which is among you, taking the oversight of it. Um, that's your responsibility, to oversee. Like the father of a household. That's what you are. You're overseeing, presiding over the household of God, the brotherhood. Um, you are, you're the one who delegates, leads. Um, again, it's through your preaching, not because I was invested with any special authority or power, but through the teaching of the Word of God, you lead the church into green pastures and good, good uh, nourishment. Um, you have the oversight of it. You, you, you delegate, you encourage, you, uh, you guide. Um, it's not a matter of authority. It's by example, and 1 Peter 5, 2 talks about that. Uh, interestingly enough, the uh, passage in 1 Peter 5, as well as in Acts, it says, take heed over, you know, the flock, feed the flock of God, which is among you. The feeding that a pastor does is that of teaching, and you can't teach people who don't come. It's people who are among you, because <laughs> um, that's his primary job of feeding the sheep, and if they don't come or they don't assemble when the sheep assemble, um, that, that's not possible. Well, I guess today it is. If people go online after the service. <laughs> they go home, and thanks to Carl, uh, they put up the, uh, the messages on our whole service online. But... Uh, but, so that superintendent of workforce, a pastor is to lead and direct, administrate, delegate, and hold it all together. Um, he's like in the body of Christ. He's not the ear, the hand, the mouth, the nose, the foot. Uh, the pastor is like all the sinew. <laughs> he's like the, the nervous system within the body that kind of holds and has a, has a, a pulse uh, on everything. He, he holds it all together. That's kind of what he does. And then he has to be a lover of people. Uh, that passage in, in Philippians chapter 1 where, where Paul says um, how, how he longs after you with the affections of Jesus Christ. I have you in my heart, he says. Uh, every remembrance of you, I, I, I thank God upon every remembrance of you with joy. Uh, there was a love, and, and Paul loved these people. Um, and so he has to be a lover of people. All kinds of people, by the way. Um, not biased, prejudiced. James reminds us about that, and this is true of everybody, but particularly the pastor. He can't have favorites and be biased against people. Um, that passage in James 2 where it says, what if, you know, someone comes into your assembly and, and uh, he's really in fine clothes, dressed like Uncle Zeke and got a Sunday best on, and he's dressed up and you say, oh, sit right here in a good place. And another man comes in, a poor man in filthy garments, and you say, oh, you sit over there, sit down by my footstool. 
Have you not become partial and become evil judges? Shown partiality among yourselves? Yeah. And so pastor can't be that. He has to lead the flock in being unbiased. Uh, because God saves people out of every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation, doesn't he? Uh, that means um, out of every nationality, every continent, God has his eye on and uh, has chosen to save uh, these people. And so if any of those people were to come into our assembly, we have to love them. We have to share the gospel with them. Doesn't matter whether they're red, brown, yellow, black, or white. Doesn't matter what accent or language or ethnicity they are. Because uh, God has people, uh, his elect from all those. And he also intends to save every kind of sinner. I say every kind. Notice over in Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. He says in verse 2, to speak evil of no one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Why? Why would we be so nice to all people? Well, because verse 3, for we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Well, that is until God saved us. Verse 4, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior appeared, not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. We were all that kind of people. Every kind of sinner there was. In fact, if you look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul does the same thing here. He says, uh, verse 9, do, not, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, reviler, revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. What kind of people does God save? Sinners. Every kind of sinner. From every kind of ethnicity and background and color, shape, and size. You know what that means? Somebody had to have compassion on those people when they were in that condition, and they shared with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody preached to them the good news. Pastors can't be biased toward any kind of sinner or any kind of person. They've got to be faithful in teaching and preaching the truth, and praying that God will use that message to save souls. Oh, by the way, he's supposed to love his own people too, the sheep, <laughs> once they are saved. Uh, they, but, but, but sinners he has to love too to carry on that ministry. And he, leads the, he sets the example for everyone in the church. He's also got to be an elder. Uh, the word in the Hebrew or in the Greek is presbyteros. He's, he's the elder. It means he's spiritually mature. He's evidenced spiritual maturity that he has his senses exercised to discern good and evil. He has a, a sense of spiritual wisdom that is an ability, not just the knowledge of Scripture, but able to apply Scripture to life. This is what God's Word means, and this is how it applies in our lives and how we're to live. That's spiritual maturity, and an elder has to have that, and he also has to exhibit a godly example. His own life must be an example. 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul told uh, young Timothy, I say young, he was probably 40 or better. Uh, but he says, let no man despise or looks down on your youthfulness, Timothy, but you be an example of the believers. An example. It's the Greek word uh, tupos, uh, a die or a stamp as it's stamped into metal or or clay, and so that that is an exact duplicate of this. You're to be the pattern, the model of what a believer is supposed to be like. That's what an elder is. That's what a pastor is. That's what an overseer is. He is a man who shows spiritual wisdom. He knows the scripture, he's able to apply it, and you can see it in his own life so that what he is should be reproduced in the people he ministers to. He's that that stamp or that die be an example. Well, he's an elder. He's an example. 
We probably look and we read all this and you say, well, nobody can match up to that. I can't. It's impossible that a man can be all that. And that's true. And that's why Paul, even the Apostle Paul says, uh, we have no confidence in the flesh. We have nothing. Our, our confidence, our, our, our competency is in the Lord. The pastor has to be a man of faith. He has to be a man of prayer. He has to be a person who's able to cast all his care on him, knowing that he cares for you. Uh, he has to be thick-skinned. He has to be a man who's forgiving. Well, there's a lot. we can't go any farther today. We'll continue this study, however, because this is the man that we're looking for. Again, we're not looking for Uncle Zeke. We're looking for something better. We're not looking for Tim Bannell. We're looking for something better. And God has a man that he's going to bring to our church. Maybe he's already here that will lead our church in the decades to come. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And thank you that uh, even though the apostles are not here to ordain elders today, uh, you have given that responsibility to the church. And you've given to the church these holy scriptures which uh, outline for us very detail of what we're to be looking for in this man. Uh, what his job description is. Uh, what his character is to be like. Uh, the requirements you've given to us, you've written them right down for us in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 and other passages, Lord. And so we just pray that you'll give us now discernment and open eyes as we look about looking for that man whom you have prepared to be our next pastor. Uh, we just pray, Father, that we would take all of these things, actually, and we look and say, well, this is the kind of man of God or woman of God that we're all to be. And that's right. Even though the pastor is supposed to lead in this and be the example, we're all supposed to come to this kind of spiritual maturity. And so we just pray, Lord, that we would look at these requirements and, and seek, to, uh, seek to have you form and fashion our lives like this and uh, come to this point, Lord, where you'll use us in greater ministry. We'll, we'll, we'll be thankful to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hymn number 380. We'll stand. We'll sing the first third verses. The first and third verses of 380. Rise up. in prayer, please. Thank you.